First organized in 1824, Hendricks County was named for William Hendricks, then governor of the young state. From its humble beginnings, Hendricks County has risen to become the second fastest growing county in Indiana. Located in the heart of the county, just south of the Danville Town Square, lies the Hendricks County Historical Museum. The museum is dedicated to preserving important artifacts that help to tell the story of the residents of Hendricks County. Their collection includes artifacts from the Central Normal College, a space dedicated to military artifacts, and a parlor room decorated with late 18th century furnishings. The Cascade Middle School Pace class has come to the museum to investigate little known artifacts in their collection and help to share their story with the world. Come and join us as we examine this week's episode of The Secrets on the Shelf. This looks like an ordinary bust of a Native American, but this artifact is nothing but ordinary, counting its history. The artifact is made completely out of bronze, which is a yellow-brownish alloy of copper and is modeled after a Native American's head. This lifelike and life-size bust is 9.5 inches by 7.5 inches and was created by Clifford Click Relander. Other sculptures created by Click have been found in Washington and are made mostly of clay. Clifford Curtis Freelander, or Click Freelander, was born on January 16, 1908, and grew up on a farm near Danville, Indiana. In his earlier years, he moved to Los Angeles to study sculpting. In 1945, he moved to Yakima, Washington, and worked as an editor for a local newspaper. He also lived with a local Wanapum tribe, and often made sculptures of them. His three most common people to sculpt were Puck Hayatut, also known as Rex Buck, Johnny Buck, who was a priest, and a man named Ich Pa Paul. Ich Pa Paul is the face of Click sculpture and the Indian medicine singer, which is featured in Hendricks County Museum. Many other sculptures are featured in the Yakima Valley Museum in Washington. Click also wrote a book on his findings and life stories from being around the Wanapum called Drummers and Dreamers. Sadly, Click Relander passed away on October 20, 1969, leaving his story and sculptures behind. He was later given a proper Indian burial. Pierce Relander, Click's older brother, later donated this wonderful sculpture known as the Indian Medicine Singer to the Hendricks County Museum. Artifact is the book written by Jean Sharon Porter. It is a paperback book made in the early 1900s. It was originally published in 1911. Jean Sharon Porter was born in Largo, Indiana. She later moved to Geneva, Indiana, and lived there most of her life. She observed the Limberlost Swamp and wrote many books about her discoveries. She was also a pioneer of photography by taking close-up photos of many animals. She also knew a lot about music and arts in general. That is why her books are filled with original photos. Years before Jean Sharon Porter moved to Geneva, a man named James Miller, nicknamed Limber Jim, went hunting. When he was hunting, he soon got lost and was later found by his friends. The swamp from then on was known as the Limber Lost Swamp, after the call used to alert others, Limber's Lost. Hi Jim. I'm going to go hunting in the swamp by the river. Okay, see ya. Be safe. After hunting, he was trying to get back to town and soon realized that he could not find the stream that he had followed to get there and was now lost. Hey, where's the gym? I think he's lost because he's been gone for a long time. Yeah, we should probably go look for him. I've been walking in circles for hours now. I need to like start marking the trees or something to find my way back to town. Hey, I think Jim said he was hunting by the stream, so maybe we should try and find him somewhere around here. Because I see footprints that way. Hey, wait, is that Jim? Hey, Jim, is that you? Oh, thank goodness you found me. I thought I was going to be lost here and here forever. Yeah, we noticed you were missing in the town, so we thought you were probably hurt. So we came to find you. Let's go home now. 
Okay, I, I'd like that. Decades later, Jean Stratton Porter and her husband, Charles Porter, decided to build an elegant house in the very same swamp. The image we have here is of Sheriff William Calvert and is held in the Hendrick County Museum located in Danville, Indiana. It is a noble shaped oil painting and has a golden frame surrounding the outer edges. William Calvert was the son of John T. Calvert and Sarah Reese. He married Mary E. Lacken on June 3, 1860 in Hendricks, Indiana. They had three children, two girls and one boy. They named their children Annie Cora Calvert, William Hatton Calvert, and Carrie Bell Calvert. The first Hendricks County Jail was made from logs and looks similar to the one in Nashville, Indiana. The jail was built between 1824 and 1830. It was located a half a block north of the square that was on Washington Street. He was elected sheriff on October 13, 1868 and for a second time on October 10, 1870. The office of the sheriff was located in a courthouse, but on weekends and evenings, he was at, when he was at home, Calvert used one of the rooms in the house as, well, an office. The office contained many objects such as the keys, the pocket watch of another sheriff's father, a notebook containing the past records of previous sheriffs and a former sheriff's book. People did break out of jail. It happened seven times. Normally, people would saw through the bars and go out the windows, which one offender escaped this way twice, four years apart. Though in 1928, two men escaped by prying loose and tearing a sheet of iron in the ceiling, and got into the attic. Then they pried the hinges off of a locked door, which led to the bedroom, which then they went in the house and out the door. Sheriff William Calvert was only sheriff from 1868 to 1872. Therefore, he was not the sheriff at the time, though. The sheriff at the time was known as Albert H. Shane, who served from 1928 to 1930. In the end, we really don't know whether or not these two offenders actually escaped permanently. Hey, where'd you get those clothes? I snatched them from the janitor's closet. Where did you get those? I stole these from another cell. Well done. Okay, what do you want a new escape plan to be? I don't know. I've been thinking for hours and I can't think of any. Do you have any? Actually, yes. I think that we could try prying loose and tearing a sheet of iron from the ceiling. Look, right above us. Do you see it? Yeah, I see it. Then we could try to pry the hinges off of the bedroom door. Brilliant. Then we could try and run out the door. Sounds good. Time for bed, guys. Get ready. Are you ready for this? Ready as I'll ever be. Okay, can you find anything to pry the iron open with? Maybe the spoon's over there in the corner. Hey, why are you two still awake? Get to bed right now. Why should we? Because I'm the sheriff. You're the sheriff. We get it. So what? Because I told you to do so. And what if we don't? Then I'll beat you and drag you so I can find me, you back sassers. We would rather be whacked. Okay then. Fine. Bye. Me. <laughs> She's just kidding. Chill out before you kill someone. This isn't a time for jokes. Sheriffs don't tell jokes with their prisoners. Fine, just let us go to bed then. Good night, and stay in your cell. Okay, we get it. It's time. You start to pry the iron off the ceiling, and then you can crawl through first. I'll go second. Okay, then you could start to pry the hinges off the bedroom door. Once you do, we head right out the main door and run. Sounds good. Hey, I need backup. They're gone. Who's gone? My own lady. Oh no. Well, go get them. Okay. Right on it. Now. We did it. Now you can't blame me. Yeah, yeah. I told you that this is a better idea. Okay, I still feel like my plan would work just as well. Whatever. Anyways, where should we hide? Are you willing to get messy? Whatever it takes. I just don't want to be here anymore. I say that we should hop in the dumpster. Ew, why would you even come up with a plan as disgusting as that? Do you want to get caught? 
Well, I mean, no. Maybe we should go back. I don't know if this is such a good idea anymore. Don't be a party pooper. Just stick with it. Just follow my lead. They're over here. Sheriff Shane. I'm here. Where are they? Heh, <laughs> we got you now. Extra time in prison for an attempted jailbreak. Not to mention, you gotta repair everything that you broke. Ook. The iron sheets, the doorknob hinges, and all. <laughs> The instrument you are looking at right now is a reed organ that is presented in the Hendricks County Museum. It has been loaned to them by Mr. and Mrs. Robert Eloise Castetter. It is made of free reed which produce the sound with pressure and wood for the frame. Some words written on the frame are Boston, Massachusetts, USA, New England, and Organ Company. The first known organ was invented in the 3rd century BC by Josephus of Alexandria. None of his writings have survived over all these years, so we know this all from reference. This organ has, was not redone until about a thousand years later, but the reed organ is a rather new instrument. It was invented in 1840 by Alexandre de Bain in France. This instrument got its name because it has a pressure system that's made with free reeds. The New England Organ Company was established in 1871 in Boston by George F. McLaughlin and Thomas F. Scanlon. In 1881, George McLaughlin left the partnership. When that happened, they changed the name to New England Piano Company and started selling only pianos. Soon after that, they started selling some of the pianos under the name of the Regal Piano Company in 1885. The line was built and controlled by the New England Piano Company of Boston. However, in 1889, the Smith American Piano Company took over the brand name. By the 1890s, the Regal Piano and Player Company was incorporated. Until 1903, the Smith American controlled the Regal Piano Company line. Some of the Smith American instruments had also the label of the Palace of Music. They were known for their exceptional pianos. This was because they were heavily populated with skilled craftsmen that were able to build high-end and expensive pianos. This gained them a lot of money. The Smith American Company didn't last very long and ended up going out of business during the Great Depression like many other businesses around it struggling to gain money. Edwin Johnson was born on September 8, 1893, and died on December 27, 1951. He was, he was a soldier for, for the United States Army. Edwin fought in World War I and was sent to a base somewhere in France between 1918 and 1919. He was transported through the New York Port of Embarkation, or NYPOE. The NYPOE was a camp that soldiers should go to before being transported to another country. NYPOE had many Atlantic ports all along the coast that were used to transport troops and cargo. These letters that Edwin had been sending to his aunt, Emily Winkleman, back in Brownsburg, Indiana, is how these letters got their name. The Winkleman Letters. Dear Anne and all, read your letters some time ago and was so glad to hear from you. The first letter was sent to Emily Winkleman on May 18, 1918 from Camp Deese, New Jersey, from Edwin Johnson. This was before the New York Port of Embarkation shipped him to France. This letter is about six and a half inches tall and around five inches wide. The second letter was sent to Emily on January 21, 1919 from an embarkation camp somewhere near St. Nazare, France. An interesting fact about this letter is that it was written on, written on American YMC paper that also says he is in active service with, with the American Expeditionary Force. This letter was around 8.3 inches tall and 5.5 and inches wide. We'll write again as soon as I get located somewhere. We'll close with love to all, Edwin. In this picture, it is unknown what Emily is reading, but many historians like to believe that she is reading a letter from Edwin. Emily Winkleman.
Winkleman married a man named Charles Louis Winkleman. He and his family immigrated from Germany in November of 1869 when he was just two months old. They lived in Maryland and operated a carpet factory. He was a Maryland volunteer and served in the Spanish-American War. When Charles came back, he worked in Ohio and Princeton at various canning factories. In 1960, he moved to Hendricks County where he operated the Brownsburg Beaning Factory. He operated this beaning factory until 1930. Edwin even mentioned the memory of loving the beans in some of his letters. In the 1800s, family Bibles were a very common way to write a family story, and that is just what this one family did. The Bibles were often used to record the different stories and the different family members within the family who owned the Bible. This is the Daniel Cox Family Bible. Daniel Cox was born July 28, 1827, and died June 4, 1890. He had 11 kids, three girls named Sarah, Alice, and Clarence, along with seven boys named Charles, Horace, Samuel, David, Elmer, Joseph, and Otis. When he died, the Bible was passed down to his son, Howard Cox. Howard Cox and his family owned a tractor with big iron wheels. Howard Cox was the ninth child. He was born in Washington Township, Hendricks County, in near Plainfield, Indiana. He went to DePaul University in 1800 to become a dentist, but his parents had other plans, so he became a farmer. Howard bought his first automobile, a Model T Ford, to have progress from a horse and buggy or carriage age to an auto, which had a self-started and shock absorbers extras on it to prove to be quite a memorable event in the lives of the Cox's family. Our Artifact is a yearbook from a school called Central Normal College, CNC for short. This book is from the year 1938. The book is pages made of paper, with a leather binding and cover. This particular book is smaller than yearbooks from other periods because its creation was sandwiched in between the top of the economy of the Great Depression and the preparation for World War II. It is about 15 by 17 inches long. There are 114 pages in this book and they featured students, faculty, clubs, Greek life, classes, administration, events, culture, and athletics, and other exciting programs within the school. This book also holds the life stories of countless individuals within its pages. In this video, we'll be investigating the lost stories that are printed on these papers and telling the world the lost stories of the CNC 1938 yearbook. We first research a staff member of the school. Horace W. Ferris was born on December 3rd, 1894. Horace fought in World War I after he graduated high school. After the war ended, he became the superintendent of schools in 1988. He worked there until the institution closed down. In 1951, he married a woman named Elizabeth M. Chastain. He died at the age of 85 on January 14, 1980. He was buried in Crown Hill Cemetery. After searching through the yearbook, we found a student by the name of Harold Long. We discovered that him and two other men were in a state award-winning trio of cornets that was recognized by many schools in the state of Indiana. Later, Harold would go on to serve in World War II in the Air Corps. He received an honorable discharge in 1945. Harold worked as an assembler at Bendix Corp, where he made automobiles. He served there for 35 years. His retirement followed soon after. He has two children named Philip and Jerry Long. He died on October 10, 2010. He is buried in Granger, Indiana, located near Lake Michigan. Then we found the image of a woman named Marcel Martin. The school paper was called the Campus Crier, and kids that were possibly interested in going into a media field would work on the paper here. Marcel Martin was the business manager for the newspaper. She used to live in Fairhorn, Ohio, before traveling to Indiana for college. She was an active member in the newspaper club, as well as a communications club, and a member of Kappa Phi Beta. She would later marry Charles J. Martin, but have no kids. She died before her husband in 1995.
of Prussian blue and poppy red colors, this Prussian uniform resembles the ones used during the Napoleonic, Austro-Prussian War, and Franco-Prussian War. The history of Prussia originated in Brandenburg in later centuries, the Austro-Prussian War. A couple years ahead of another war broke out, known as the Franco War between the Third French Republic and the German Confederation. This war is believed to be the one that our blue Prussian uniform was used in. Prussian uniform could be seen almost always on von Modkin. Staff General Helmuth von Modkin was a commanding officer who planned and commanded troops during the Franco-Prussian War. During this battle, he wore a Prussian uniform similar to ours as formal apparel. With the iconic Prussian blue, most commonly was the cape and the hat used for harsh weather and distinguish himself from others. These were important parts of the uniform to tell apart each commander, but also wore by each soldier without the unique cape. A famous man by the name of Helmut von Molke was made chief of the Prussian General Staff in 1857. The common uniform that I wore most likely resembles ours due to the iconic shoulder pads and other features that are similar. Molt was a well-respected soldier who planned and led other soldiers into battle. While serving in the Franco-Prussian War, he rose to the ranks of general staff and in this time, the uniform that he wore became more updated and different than ours. The object that we found was a round metal object that has a small hole open in the top. On the inside, there appears to be residue that is dry and grainy, most likely from gunpowder. The hole is possibly meant for a fuse to be lit. Our artifact is a cannonball, undoubtedly a fused cannonball used in the Civil War. Many of these types of cannonballs were used in the Battle of Port Hudson as a way of clearing out large amount of ground infantry that were stationed there to protect it. Here, here, take this. General Butler just ordered a strike at these three places, 19 degrees 32 minutes 47 seconds north, and 19 degrees 37 minutes 27 seconds north. He wanted you to soften up the New Orleans defenses. Thank you. All right, you heard the man. Load up those guns. Don't slack off. We have got a war to win. Remember who you're fighting for. Remember what you're fighting for. The Union. Now get to loading that gun. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, according to these coordinates, we need a we need a fused cannonball. All right, now prepare to fire. And fire. County Museum, there is a glass display case, and within that display case there are several artifacts related to food and rations from the Civil War. Some of the artifacts on display are cans that held food like fruit cocktail and possibly other foods like sweet and condensed milk. There is also equipment that the soldiers used to make their food like bowls and silverware. There is even a canteen that Civil War soldiers would use to carry around fresh water, which could be difficult to find at times. On the far left side of the display case, there are four cloth sacks with small re plastic resealable bags that held sugar, flour, beans, and coffee that belonged to settlers. According to the dictionary, in the Civil War, a settler was a peddler who follows an army to sell goods and food to the soldiers. Basically, a settler was not somebody who was enlisted in the war, but they are only a civilian, and they made a business by supplying food and an assortment of other articles to the troops. The settlers would often sell their goods from tents or wagons. The articles that these settlers sold only cost a dollar or less. They sold items from their tents or wagons such as cheese, tobacco, paper, and condensed milk. But they were not allowed to sell alcohol or they would lose their permit to sell to the troops if they were caught selling it. They also sold molasses, cakes, and cookies. Considered most of these items that the settlers sold, especially desserts, delicacies, compared to the hardtack that they had to eat often. 
After the soldiers were forced to eat hardtack and rations, such as salted pork and beans, for a long period of time, they would really enjoy it when they were able to eat other food items. Especially because hardtack was not very tasty. The soldiers had several nicknames for the hardtack, too. They would call it things like tooth dollars, worm castles, and sheet iron crackers. These names were referring to how dry and hard the hardtack was and how they could even be infested with insects or even worms. Hardtack was invented by Josiah Bent in 1801 in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Bent discovered hardtack when he put bread over a fire and turned into a hard cracker. The reason that we used to use hardtack is because it would last a long time in the given conditions during the war. They could be stored in buildings before they were given to the soldiers. The supplies for hardtack were also easy to find and they were cheap to obtain. The recipe that we found to make hardtack, similar to the hardtack found in the Civil War, says that you mix five cups of flour to one cup of water containing a half tablespoon of salt. Knead into a dough and roll out until three eighths of an inch thickness. Cut into approximately three inch squares and pierce each with a fork or ice pick several times. Bake in a 400 degree oven for 30 minutes or until slightly brown. While hardtack was eaten often among the soldiers, it did cause problems too. As the soldiers would eat the hardtack, it would break their teeth and cause many other problems. To try to resolve this problem, the soldiers would dip the hardtack into their coffee to try to make it softer. This is a picture of our artifact, opera glasses. Bill Franklin received the opera glasses from his grandfather. The glasses belonged to Bill's grandfather's first wife and they lived together in Wisconsin. His grandfather was born in the late 1890s and the opera glasses were usually used most popularly between the 1920s and 1940s. The dimensions of the opera glasses are 3 inches long by 3.5 inches wide on one end and 4 inches wide by 1 3 quarters inches deep on the other end. Their main structure is made of brass and it is decorated with ivory and gems. There are two opera houses that are located in Hendricks County, one in Plainfield and the other one in North Salem. They both got shut down and are no longer running today. Opera glasses are used all the time in opera houses and can help you see things better than might be far away. Opera glasses can also be used to look into the sky and discover many things. You can even see all of Jupiter's moons with a good pair of opera glasses. Look at the sky, isn't it beautiful? Yep, I can't see that well. The stars are so far away. Hey, I have an idea of something that might help us see the sky better. What's that? The only thing I know of is a telescope. I don't think you have one of those in your bag. Well, you're right, I don't. But we could use a pair of my old opera glasses to see them better. They work just as good as a telescope, maybe even better sometimes. Yeah, that's a good idea. We should try it right now. Okay, I have a pair of them in my bag. So, here you go, why don't you try them? Okay, thanks. I've heard the opera glasses have been used before to see all of Jupiter's moons. Cool, maybe we should try it. Okay, sounds good. Why don't you use them first and see what you can see? Okay, thanks. Is that? I think it might be Jupiter. I can see one, no, two of its moons. Let me see. Okay. Whoa, that's spectacular. I've never seen anything like this before without these glasses. This is, this is such a cool experience. I never thought opera glasses would work this well to see you into space. Hey, can I look at something else? Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. I remember overhearing someone say that you can also see Saturn from Earth with opera glasses. I think that I see it on one of its moons. Which moon do you think it is? I remember someone told me that Titan is Saturn's biggest moon. I think it's Titan. That's cool. I know, right? That's the coolest thing ever. Okay, well, I should probably get going. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Our object is a gas mask that was used in World War I. 
The gas mask is tan or brown in color and has a gray tube connecting the mask to the canister, which is used to filter oxygen. The canister is yellow and appears to be very worn. Gas masks like these were originally designed by James Burt Garner, who figured out how to counter the mustard gas used in World War I. James Burt Garner was born in Lebanon, Indiana in 1870. He graduated to Wabash College, which was where he was able to craft one of the many gas masks that would later be used in World War I. The secret behind his masks was how they u utilized charcoal, which Garner theorized that it would be able to absorb the mustard gas. The first attempt involved two people wearing the masks while exposed to deadly chemicals. Surprisingly, the test worked and led to many other future designs. Even dogs, horses, and camels wore gas masks to protect themselves. He eventually passed away on November 28, 1960. During World War I, soldiers would be fighting. During that time, a container of mustard gas would fall down from the sky. The mustard gas would come out of the container and look like smoke was coming from the ground. The soldiers would have to put on a gas mask, or they would die. The mustard gas would be aimed for trenches. That way the soldiers would be flushed down the trenches. If a soldier came out the trench, then they would be shot almost immediately. So either way, the soldier would be dead. The main reason for that was that way the soldiers would be an easier target either way. This is the John Deere Potato Harvester 1920s edition. This machine was frequently used by both fans of John Deere as a company and farmers new to growing potatoes just because of the ease of using it. It was a very much a simple machine that got the job done. One difference between this and a normal John Deere product though is the color. This is a red potato harvester, while John Deere's signature is green and yellow. So how did it get to be like this? There are multiple theories out there concerning this, and the one we chose to present will be shown in this following skit. Hi, I'm a salesman from John Deere. I'm looking to buy that potato harvester. Oh, this is our only prototype. We can't go selling it. We can make some serious money off of this. Okay, then. Oh, God. It was it was just here. Where did it... Is it back? Where did it... Oh, I can't... No, I can't lose my job. Where... Where'd it go? Our artifact is the CNC Canterbury Bell Dress. This dress is heather gray with lavender trimming. There is a lavender braid belt that ties around the waist. The dress is hooded with a lavender strip cuffing the hood and a patch of the fabric on the front of the collar. The Canterbury Bells often performed in this dress and they would perform at the Masonic Lodge and many other events. There is a slit on the left side of the dress and the dress was fitted to each girl and went down to their ankles. The Canterbury Bells were started in 1941 by Marjorie Dean Gaston. Marjorie was born on May 4, 1906. She was the daughter of the late Carrie W. and Ida Del Gaston. Her father was a prominent local attorney. She was graduated from Danville High School. She received a master's degree from DePaul University. Marjorie was one of the first women to attend Oxford College for Women. She attended this college for one year. Here she studied music and found her passion. This sparked her interest and caused her to start the Canterbury Bells at Central Normal College in Danville, Indiana. Now girls, Sue will be modeling our dress we will be wearing for performances this year. Thank you. When she started this sextet, she was also in charge of the Canterbury Culinaires, which was the men's quartet. She was inspired by the Canterbury Bell for the name of the group. The girls' group went strong for a solid 10 years until they faded out. Marjorie Dean Gaston was the heart of this group, and once she left, they lost their spark. She died at age 67 and was buried at Danville South Cemetery.
Terrence N. Hickman was born on a farm near Lisbon in, H in Hendricks County, Indiana in 1889. He moved to several farms during his childhood, where he developed an interest in archery and even played with bows and arrows made by his father. Clarence then moved to Jamestown, where he, where he would go to, where he went to high school. But it was in Waynesville where where Clarence would graduate high school. Clarence would go to college at Clark University, Massachusetts, and fin and finish his studies in 1917, getting getting an A.B. degree. He would he would go on on to work with Robert H. Goddard, the father of rocketry, as his assistant and partner. In 1919, Goddard arranged for Clarence to work with Dr. H.C. Curtis in the Inductance and, pa and Patients Laboratory. He would then, then return to Clark University in 1920 to get his PhD. In 1940, he was appointed as a consultant for the U.S. Army. There he would invent the bazooka, inspired by the German Panzerschreck and it would be used as an anti-tank, anti-infantry, anti and anti-structure weapon. It would go on to see use for the rest of World War II, and would even see use in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, until it was replaced by the M72 LAW. He would go on to make many more items for the U.S. military, such as recoilless rifles and airplane rockets. He also made the Ampico B, a piano for the American Piano Company, which was considered one of the best pianos of its time. Hello, Clarence. Haven't seen you in a while. How's it been? I've been great, Charles. Any recent projects you've been working on? Yes, actually. I've made a, I've been made a consultant for the U.S. Army, and I think I've come up with a counter to German rockets. Really? What is it? I call it the bazooka. How does it work? It's very simple. One man, one man holds it, holds a small rock, shoves a small rocket into the back end, and then the front man aims and fires the gun. It can be used by one man, but it's more efficient with two. Interesting. How did this come about? We hope this to be a good infantry base counter to German armor and bunkers, as well as a counter, a counter to their infantry-based rockets. I'm so proud of you. Now, I need to get back to making this new model, so if you'll excuse me. You're right. I have other things to work on as well. Goodbye. The first icebox ever created was lined with rabbit fur by Thomas Moore around 1801, but the more modernized iceboxes from around the early 1900s were composed of wood and lined with zinc or also even metal. With the help of this insulation, it reduced the amount of ice melted from 66% to 8%. These non-electronic advances in technology were kept cold with the help of large blocks of ice. There had to be a special plan placed underneath the ice boxes due to the lack of electricity to keep the ice cold, so the ice would eventually melt. This tray had to be frequently emptied because of the large amounts of melted ice. This method didn't keep all foods from spoiling, so the food also had to have many different preservatives to keep it unspoiled. This made it possible for leftovers that used to only last for one meal and now lasted many meals. The skit we are creating includes real facts stated by R and R McDaniel Co. It is presented to you in a commercial form, so it is much easier for your viewing purposes. This has been slightly exaggerated, so not all information may be conveyed as its original purpose. Hello there, I'm your average day iceman, and here are some things to keep in mind so that make my day much better. First off is the hangar sign at 7 o'clock in the morning. To show the amount of ice that you want, you might want to tie it down so that way it doesn't blow away. Second is to put your ice book packet on the nail so that the ice book packet is easily for me to get the tickets out. And if you're paying with cash, leave the change on top of the ice box. Good thing I'm paying with change, I could leave it on top right here. Finally, I leave you with my final words of wisdom. Leave your doors unlocked when your window sign is up. Click. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you take this all into consideration the next time you need some ice from the Iceman. This artifact found at the Hendricks County Historical Museum in Danville, Indiana is a full mouth speculum used for the equine dentistry. This item is designed to hold a horse's mouth open while an equine dentist works on the teeth. The item is a metal device held on the horse's head with a bridle style adjustable head stall. The speculum is placed between the horse's top teeth and bottom jaw during inspection. The hinges on the speculum adjust how far the horse's mouth is open. These next artifacts are other equine dental tools. Some of the tools included are forceps and floats. These tools are made out of metal and most include wooden handles. Some of the tools can be used for removing teeth from the horse, filing down rough, uneven parts of the horse's molars, and more. With these tools, it can make equine dentistry much easier and many of the tools are still used today. Many of the equine dental artifacts are used on racehorses such as Navajo, who was locally raised in Hendricks County. In 1970, two horsemen, Joe Stevens and Ray Stump, bred a dark gray thoroughbred colt, later known by the name of Navajo. Hours of training was done and lots of time was spent getting the yearling to be ready by when he was just two years old so that he could be taken to his first race at Liberty Bell Park. Hey Tom, congratulations. Hey Joe, what happened? Did I miss something? No, you and Navajo are going to Kentucky Derby, right? What do you mean? What I'm saying is that Navajo was on the spot at the Kentucky Derby and I'd like you to be my jockey. Wait, really? Yeah, since we've worked so hard and won so many races, they offered us a spot on the track, and I would not let any other jockey race him. Are you sure this is true? Yes, I got a phone call before the race, and they said that they reminded the story of how a couple of farm boys raised the horse with a pig tail running in the Kentucky Derby, so they're willing to give us a shot. That's amazing, but we don't have the money to go, and our little has a sore mouth for the big race. But this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I need my best jockey. We can't do this. What if Malcolm doesn't win? Please? Fine. But we're going to need to call the equine dentist to see if anything else is wrong. Joe Stevenson and his jockey Tom made an agreement to go to the Kentucky Derby. I checked Navajo and everything is okay. Just a little sore and should be fine in a day or so. Thanks, Doc. We really appreciate it. No problem. And good luck at your race. Thank you so much. After winning a large amount of money, the owners started having high hopes about Navajo's potential and maybe even competing in the Derby. On May 5, 1973 was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for them to compete in the Kentucky Derby. Navajo finished his racing career with eight wins out of the 13 races he participated in. Although he didn't come through with winning the Kentucky Derby, millions of people heard the story of how a couple of Indiana farm boys and their horse became part of racing history. Our topic of study was over the Browning Club of Hendricks County. Our artifacts were a photo of Robert Browning, who was the inspiration of the Browning Club, and a pamphlet from the club years 1975 to 1976. Robert Browning was a famous poet from the United Kingdom. He wrote poems such as The Pied Piper of Hamelin, My Star, Up at a Villa, Down in the City, and My Last Duchess. He was born in May 1812 and died on December 12, 1889. Many of Browning's poems were based off of American literature. These works were more favored by the Americans. The Browning Club was founded in 1891 as a means of entertainment for the woman of Danville. The club originally focused on Robert Browning and his poems, but now focuses on a wide variety of subjects. There have been many presidents of the Browning Club, with the current president being Mary Jane Hardung. This year marks the 128th year since the club was formed. Ladies, the meeting has now begun. I would like to thank Mrs. Ruth Joseph for opening up her home to us today. It was my pleasure. There are snacks and fresh friends in the kitchen. Okay, let's begin attendance. Ruth Porter. My star. Grace Gibbs. The Pied Piper of Hamlin. Ruth Joseph. I put a villain down in the city. Nancy Sutton. My last duchess. Great. Today we'll be discussing Robert Browning's poem, The Last Duchess. Let's begin the reading. That's my, my last, last duchess, duchess painted on the, on the wall, looking, looking as if she were alive. What do we think this work is about? I think it's about a painting. He talks about it being on the wall and looking as if it were alive. I agree with that 
but he does say that paint must never help to reproduce the fate. Obviously, it is made of paint and is a piece of art. Okay, ladies, good discussion. Let's enjoy the rest of our evening with some snacks and beverages. At the Henders County Historical Society, there is a women's World War II military uniform similar to the one that Frances Deborah Brown wore during her time in service. These uniforms are made of dark blue, thick material and were worn with a crest-shaped hat. A long navy blue skirt made of the same material was also worn and it set at the knees. White gloves were worn along with brown lace-up boots. In 1943, Frances Deborah Brown took the James Whitcomb Rally train from Chicago to her home in Danville, Indiana to enlist in the Army. She then took a Cincinnati train from Indianapolis to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and later rode in a truck to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. In this image, you can see the train that Frances Deborah Brown took to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Frances later arrived at her base in Oglethorpe, Georgia on May 31, 1943. She unpacked her things and prepared herself for the rest of the day to come. As soon as she arrived, she was fitted for her uniform and shoes. Frances enjoyed writing numerous letters to her family about what was going on in her life in the military. Mrs. Brown, it is time for you to be fitted for your uniform. Okay. Dear Dad and Mother, I know you've been wondering about me, but the Army keeps me very busy, and I think they informed you that I arrived safely. We received our mailing address Friday at noon, so I waited until I could give it to you. Now I will try to give you some ideas of things that happened. While waiting in Indianapolis for the Cincinnati train, I recognized a girl in the station who was sworn with me. Since we were wearing large buttons that proclaimed we were WAAC enrollees, we were hard to miss. I had company on the train. We arrived in Chattanooga, Tennessee at 4.15 p.m. as per schedule and joggled to camp in the back of an army truck. Was my suitcase heavy? I regretted that I had it, yet I practically used everything in it. Mrs. Brown, your uniform is waiting for you in the front office. Okay. This artifact is located in the Hendricks County Historical Museum in Danville, Indiana. The artifact is a picture of Central Normal College's baseball team from around the 1930s. The picture is also in black and white and has a dark wooden frame around it. One of the most notable players from CNC that played professionally was Samuel Sam Thompson, but he's not pictured in the artifact. Here is an image of Sam Thompson when he played professional baseball for Detroit. He was 6 feet and 2 inches tall, and he was most notably known for his handlebar mustache. Sam Thompson was born on March 5, 1860 in Danville, Indiana, and he died on November 7, 1922. Sam started playing professionally for the Evansville Indiana team in 1884. He played on three different Major League Baseball teams as a right fielder. The teams that he played on included the Detroit Wolverines, Philadelphia Phillies, and the Detroit Tigers from 1885 to 1906. He married Ida Marasha in 1888 and they had no children. He was also eventually inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1974. Sam and multiple other players were asked to come on a fishing trip and they weren't told how long they were going to be out there. Most of the players took the opportunity to get to know their potential future teammates. 
I'm excited to get to know you since we have a possibility of playing together. Yeah, this fishing trip was a really good idea. Do you know how many days you're going to be out here? No, they never told us. Oh, I'm sure it won't be too long. By this point, Sam and the other players figured they would have been off the boat and back with their families. They were starting to get angry when they decided to ask the captain. Why are we still on this boat? It's been three days. I don't know. We should go ask the captain. When are we going to go home? <laughs> You never answered our question. When are we going to get back home? You'll find out eventually. By the sixth day, they were extremely angry because the captain wouldn't answer their questions, and they were very tired of being on the boat. We're doing it at the same time. We've been on this boat for six days. When are we going home? I was instructed to keep you for ten days. You have four more. You can't do that. That's kidnapping. I'm only doing what I was instructed to do. <sighs> After ten days, everyone was finally allowed to leave the boat and go back to their house. When Sam got back to his house, he opened his mailbox and found a load of other offers from various teams. He wasn't allowed to accept those offers because the 10-day period was already up. Finally, after 10 terrible days, I'm finally home. Time to get the mail. Ugh. All this time, they just kept us on that stupid boat so we couldn't accept any other offers. After Sam and the other players realized that they had been kidnapped so they could not accept any other offers, they went to the manager of the Detroit team. I have been offered to be part of so many other teams, but now it's past the deadline. We had no idea that we were going to be on that trip for so long. This isn't fair. We should be able to look at our other offers. I'm sorry, but that's not my problem. You had a deadline and you failed to meet it. 